Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. This is the Urban Land Institute presentation on the I-4 corridor um, economic opportunities. Um, we anticipate to have a great uh, presentation this morning. I just ask everybody here at the tables, I was reminded, please speak clearly into the microphone um, so that you will be recorded. And with that, I will turn the meeting over to Mike Merrill, our county administrator, for the overview. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just briefly, to, to kind of set the table here, this was a uh, week-long process, significant and meaningful dialogue and work to uh, assess, engage the opportunities for the county to develop the I-4 corridor for two reasons. One, for uh, improving our economic prosperity and also our quality of life. And so uh, Lucia Garces will, will talk about the process for the committee, but I, I just really want to thank you all so much for taking your time and, and being here. And, and uh, the chair, Alan Razak, and vice chair, Molly McCabe, thank you very much. And, and the ULI staff, Beth Silverman and Rose Kim, uh, it's just a, a magnificent process. Um, <clears throat> and I also have to uh, give kudos and thanks and recognize uh, Lucia Garces and her staff, uh, who put in an awful lot of work. Uh, John Patrick, uh, Adam Gormley, George Cassidy, um, John Lyons, I'm sure I'll forget a couple of others. Um, but truly um, outstanding staff work that was, that was done to, to prepare this. And of course, finally, just to thank the board and our residents and stakeholders who, who took out their time uh, to meet and be interviewed by the <laughs> panel and give us their feedback. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Lucia. Thank you, commissioners, and welcome, everyone. Um, I want to thank the stakeholders as well who are here today, but who also gave of their time to come to the interviews. I know that for some of you, it came at a time that was inopportune, at a location that could have been closer to home. But we are really grateful to each and every one of you for have given the time to be at the um, stakeholder interviews. The stakeholder interviews are a hallmark of the ULI process. And we have gone, uh, really looked as hard as we could to get the best cross-section, inviting people to provide the widest and broadest perspectives of the community and the I-4 corridor, respectively. So we are grateful to each and every one of you who participated. So thank you for participating, and thank you for being here today. But like Mike, I just want to talk a little bit also about the process itself. Just for the board members, to a reminder, and for everyone here, the panel, nine people who are professionals and experts in various areas of land development, financial costs of development, and looking at design and a whole host and array of different pieces of development process participated in this. Nine panel members throughout the, throughout the United States came. They were here for a week. They are volunteers. They are not paid. <coughs> and so they don't have a vested interest in the outcome of this. Their interest is really to look at how Hillsborough County can develop, how we can protect our future, how we can be a productive uh, productive land development, how we can create jobs, and how they can provide their best input to take us to a different level. So we are grateful for them, but I think it's important to note that each one of these is volunteer and they don't have an interest in the outcome. So having said that, I think the other people that I would like to thank are Ron Barton, because it does have a, an economic development component, and his staff, Lindsey Kimball, who attended. But then there are a couple of other folks behind the scenes who made this happen, from the local ULI, Siobhan O'Kane and Jenna Wiley. And then there is one person who really kept, uh, <coughs> kept most of us sane, and that's Sandra Panol, and you probably got a number of emails from her, but she was the one that really kind of glued this all together. So having said that, um, we welcome the panel members. This is their, their final presentation, and they will talk about what happens after today a little bit, and we'll talk about what happens after today. But I just wanted to provide that introduction and perspective for you. Great, thank you very much. And I know Commissioner White has a question. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, Ms. Garces' uh, comments have led me to, to two things. Uh, first, with respect to the community stakeholders, um, it's brought, been brought to my attention that, that there were uh, uh, some challenges uh, in the stakeholder engagement as well. Um, I am confident that what we're going to receive today are very high level recommendations with plenty of details coming back to the board at the appropriate time. And as we begin to, to uh, get into those details, uh, we cannot do this without our stakeholders. So I'm going to encourage county staff once the baton has been passed to, to be sure that we continue to engage the stakeholders and continue to have community meetings. Uh, obviously, you know, I would be a, a proponent of, of making sure that they're out in the community a, as well. Uh, the Sefner community in particular is one that comes to mind, and I, I'm sure we have some sites out there that, that would lend themselves well to that. Uh, secondly, uh, I just want to echo your sentiments, uh, Ms. Garces, on the fact that we're dealing with a volunteer panel here. Uh, that, that's a big deal. You know, it really demonstrates that the spirit of volunteerism is still alive and well in this country. We have uh, some folks here that, that really have a vested interest in, in making sure that, uh, that we have a well-planned community that, that lends itself to a, a high level of quality of life for our residents. And uh, I think it's worth noting that, you know, we're a week and a half out from Christmas at this point. So, you know, while a lot of people are out there hustling and, and, and making sure they have the turkey in the freezer and they're buying the last minute gifts and everything, we have these folks here that uh, have so kindly given of their time to come and, <coughs> and, and assist us with this exercise. And I just can't thank you all enough for that. So. Yeah, I do I agree with those comments. And actually, you were here four years ago for the uh, economic prosperity uh, report, um, which I think is before Commissioner Kemp was on the board and Commissioner White both. <coughs> and, um, you know, it's the same, your, your devotion and commitment to economic development and prosperity in communities throughout our United States does not go unnoticed. Um, it's a labor of love, I'm sure, and you have to love this work to be able to want to give up your family life to come here and do this. So uh, much appreciation uh, from us uh, to you um, going forward. Commissioner, I think you raised a really good point. ULI was here <coughs> in 2012, and out of that report came a stakeholder committee, and you and uh, Commissioner Miller chaired that stakeholder committee. I think that was the foundation that turned a lot around in this community at a time when we were facing the recession in terms of working with um, economic development, development, and prosperity in this community. So it really was, we keep taking steps, but that's the foundation upon <coughs> which it was built. Great, thank you. Okay, so how, what's, um, we're gonna call up Alan uh, Razak. I don't wanna mispronounce your name. It happens all the time. Not a worry. <laughs> um, who is chair of the ULI advisory panel. Thank I you. am. Um, and just by way of introduction, first of all, let me uh, say thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners uh, and members of the audience for having us here today. Um, I'm afraid you made it sound a little bit too much like hardship <coughs> for us to come and participate on the panel. It's really not. Um, we are away from our family members in our respective homes, but we make new family members while we're here. Um, and it really is a joy for us to come and to participate in a process that's helping communities move forward uh, in an intelligent way. So by way of introduction, my name is Alan Razak, that's how you pronounce my last name. Uh, I'm from Philadelphia. Uh, I'm trained as an architect, but for the last 38 years, I have been a real estate consultant and developer in the Philadelphia area. Um, as you said, I am the uh, chair of the panel. Um, and I wanna tell you to start off with just a little bit about the Urban Land Institute. Um, ULI is uh, an international organization, has about 40,000 members, that's dedicated to research and education. Okay, that's uh, in the real estate a, a, industry. Can, we, can Alan, you hear me? Can we pause for one second? Sure. Um, we as board members cannot see the presentation on the screens. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I think this would be an important point. That could, um, that could be a problem. Uh, but we do want the audience to be able to see, but they have those two screens back there, so maybe flip. I, I might try to move that one. Yeah. 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 And then I Perfect. would say let's move this one back for the audience. Yeah. yeah. There's two screens for the audience. 
move the mic over a little more. Oh, good. They've got good. Yeah, they have two screens already. Yeah, one's is, over there and one's over there. Okay. Yeah, so Actually, this, one, this one, I would there, prefer. That's good. Yeah, good. that's good. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, ready okay. to go. And uh, just sound check. I want to make sure that people can hear me. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, so as I was saying, ULI uh, is an international organization. It's about 40,000 members worldwide. Um, we're dedicated to research and education. I think that's important because we are not a political organization. We don't lobby for anything. We just study and recommend. And we're dedicated to, uh, as it says up here, um, the responsible use of land and promulgating tools and ideas for how uh, real estate can be used in a sustaining way in thriving communities. Our members run the entire gamut of the real estate industry, everyone from public officials through real estate developers, through people in the design industry, academics, students, land planners, um, people in finance, people in construction, et cetera. So it's a true cross-section of the industry. And you can see on this list, I'm not going to read them, but you can see on this list what the Urban Land Institute does. In particular, I want to talk about the program that we're here on today, the Advisory Services Program. Um, this is a long-standing program and commitment by ULI. It's been uh, in effect since 1947. They've done hundreds of uh, panels like this. Uh, and the idea is that we bring a group of experts selected by ULI who are pertinent to the problem, and they are brought together for a week to analyze uh, uh, an issue or issues and to make recommendations. Um, I want to, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit more about the process. We're here for five and a half days. We arrive on Sunday evening. We're given a very brief introduction to the sponsors. We are given materials to review uh, prior to our arrival, and we are expected to have read them by the time we get here. That's almost always the case, that we have read them. Um, <laughs> Not always, but uh, 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 usually the case. We're given a tour on Monday morning. We're given an, uh, an introductory session with uh, key members of the sponsor group. Uh, in this case, many of the people from both the county and county stakeholders were present at that briefing. On Tuesday, we interviewed 95 people um, from all specters of the spectrum of the, of the issue, uh, from the community through uh, people from various stakeholder groups, business groups, uh, and governmental agencies. <clears throat> At the end of Tuesday, our information gathering, raw information gathering is done, and we sequester ourselves and start analyzing the problem. Um, all day Wednesday we wrote, all day Thursday we put together presentation. All that time we were talking about the issues um, and coming to agreement uh, among the panel on what we were going to recommend to the board. So today we're going to talk in this order. You're going to hear from the panelists on each one of these issues. Economic and market uh, planning and development strategies, economic development strategies, fiscal impacts, public engagement and regulatory framework for uh, implementing those, and then we'll do a brief synopsis of that. So uh, before I do that, um, I appreciate uh, Lucia doing a very thorough job of thanking people individually. We couldn't possibly thank all the people individually that participated in this, both on the ULL side and particularly on the sponsor side. Um, but um, we can list all of the people that we interviewed um, on Tuesday. And I want to thank every one of them for their participation. Our panelists um, are listed here, and uh, uh, I'm going to underscore the fact that we're from all over the place in the United States, representing different expertises in the real estate industry. Um, <coughs> and uh, you've already heard that the uh, people are volunteers. We're not paid for our efforts here, uh, except with all the food and alcohol we can possibly consume in five days. Um, we had some great food here in Tampa, by the way. Went to some great restaurants and had some great food delivered in as well. In particular, I want to thank Beth Silverman and Rose Kim from ULI staff. They're the backbone of the panel program. They're the ones who make everything work correctly, and they're the ones who keep us on track as we're going through our deliberations. So to the study area, which consisted of those two squares, which I hope you can see. It's not a very good map, but um, I'll just tell you that that study area is centered on the I-4 corridor. And um, it's those two squares that span basically from just outside the Tampa city limits, ranging east almost to Plant City. <coughs> the areas that we were asked to look at um, fell into these categories. I'm not going to read these questions, of course. Um, uh, the presentation will be available, and you can read them. And I believe that the uh, questions were posted online as well. Um, but they fall in these categories, target industries and identity, future growth scenarios, 
feasibility financing and strategy, policies, regulation, and infrastructure. If I boil the questions that you just saw down to their essence, it boils down to this. Should the study area along the I-4 corridor in those two squares be one of the target areas for development through 2040? And if so, what should those jobs look like? Uh, I'm sorry, what should the area look like in form of jobs, in the form of use mix, retail, residential, industrial, distribution, et cetera? Um, and finally, and probably most importantly, how all of that comes together um, in a certain character for that place and in a larger sense for the region as a whole. Um, secondly, we were asked uh, about what tools can be used to manage the process of uh, managing growth um, uh, in that area and uh, realistic financial strategies for implementing our recommendations. So I want to talk about this uh, first off in, in the form of density. And, uh, this is a diagram that shows density in form of persons per acre in the 50 largest cities in the United States. This is just city boundaries with the exception of the yellow bar that you see at the right. That is Hillsborough County's population density. The yellow bar uh, at uh, right center is the city of Tampa's population density. So you can see that in comparison to uh, American cities, you're on the low side of densities. Oops. That is supposed to. <laughs> you recognize the microphone. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything to be said um, uh, about the ratio that you can uh, create there with county population versus city population? Um, Frank, frankly, it seems a little bit backwards to me, which is something I've talked about a, a lot. And, and I'm excited to see some of the things that are envisioned for our urban core. But, and that may come later in the presentation yes. or may even be part of the recommendation, but. We're gonna talk a lot about density. Okay, okay. got it, um, got it. And I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm struggling a little bit with the technology. There are four okay. graphs here, and okay. unfortunately they're not, they're layered on top of each other. But, it, but at some point you'll talk about the relationship between unincorporated county and, and <laughs> city of Tampa <laughs> density. Yes. And, and, with with all with yeah, I, with all due respect, I I don't want to forget about our two smaller municipalities in Hillsborough County either. Yes, so, you know, yes. Yeah. We use Tampa City as um, uh, something of an avatar for the the denser portion of the greater Hill, Hillsborough County, um, but we thought it was important to look at Hillsborough County blended. So that that number that you see there is all of Hillsborough County, all not the Hillsborough. unincorporated right. area. Okay. Correct. Right. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to move on. Uh, however, what I am going to do is uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to have a mental picture of what I wanted to show you here, which is that, and we'll provide you with the other diagrams. Um, Im embedded in this uh, diagram are <coughs> the densities of the four areas we heard over and over again that you were competing against. Those are Atlanta, Austin, Nashville, and Charlotte. And the densities of those, the Tampa City falls kind of directly in the middle of those. Uh, Nashville's a bit of an outlier because uh, they uh, just consolidated with Davidson County, and therefore their uh, population densities are skewed to the low end. Um, the, the next slide I would show you, and I ask you to imagine this, um, is how uh, those cities are going to look in 2040 which is the same time period that we're doing the planning for. Every one of them shifts dramatically up the scale in population density. Um, the final slide I would show you is the results of what you're going to see in our presentation today, which, uh, which recommends a shift, uh, probably not as dramatic as those other regions, but certainly a shift to the left in this diagram as well, both for the county, not nearly as, uh, as far as where Tampa is now, but also for the city of Tampa, based on the allocations of population, of new population that the county has already come up with and supplied to us. These are not our assumptions, these are the county's assumptions. Okay. I apologize for the hiccup here. So the uh, role of the study area in this, um, in, in accommodating growth um, and in the future development of the county. Um, 
if we look at this like uh, real estate market analysts, uh, the study area is looks like the hole in the donut from a market point of view. There's significant development, mostly distribution and industrial oriented to the east. And then, of course, you've got Tampa City on the west, which is uh, in, enjoying a robust growth. Um, but that study area also, and, and it's bisected. I hope this works. Nope. It's bisected by I-5, which, I'm sorry, I-4, which goes right through the middle of it. But it's also centered on uh, a precious resource in Hillsborough County, which is its unique rural character. You have both of those things going on, and they're somewhat in conflict with each other sometimes. On the face of it, it looks like this could be the area for the lowest cost expansion of the current developed area because you have significant infrastructure already there in the form of transportation infrastructure. But you have to um, keep in mind what measure you use to analyze what cost is, and we're going to talk a great deal about that as we go through this presentation. We think this area can be a demonstration for how Hillsborough County wants to grow in the future and how it wants to look in the future. And it's important because how this area grows can be uh, a, a demonstration for how the region grows as a whole. So you can set an example here. When we at ULI evaluate return on investment, both cost and return on investment for um, our work, we do it in three areas, uh, environmental, economic, and social. So it's not just about the money. It's also about the returns that you get on, uh, on measures that you use for sustainability and also for um, so the well-being of the citizens of the county. So you were going to hear the panelists talk about finding the sweet spot right in the center of those three circles. That's where we would like to see the county end up in its plan for this area and for the region as a whole. So here's what we observed. Um, growth is imminent. It's going to happen unless you're planning on building a wall around the county. And the number we heard was in the area of 600,000 people over the next 25 years, which is a rate of growth. It's not an astonishing rate of growth. It's somewhere around 1.8% per year. Um, but because that is imminent, it's coming now, um, the time to act is right now um, to plan and to execute that plan. And it's time to choose whether that growth is going to lead you to positive change or it's going to erode what makes the Tampa Bay area unique. So um, you're going to hear that we uh, believe that change is needed in the way that you form the development that occurs, that the systems that you use to support that form, uh, both in the form of uh, infrastructure and also the processes and methods of communication you use, um, need to match the challenge that you're about to face. We encourage you to focus on how you stack up with competitive regions. And honestly, not just the four I named, but other competitive regions as well. Those regions are implementing and they are planning responses to changes in technology, which are going to be drastic and increasing in velocity, um, and in demographics, and in development drivers. Um, your effort should be a unified one um, to play against your competition. So with that, um, I'm going could to turn you, the presentation over to my colleagues. Could you identify what the competition is? Um, what I believe the regional competition is? Um, I think the four that you've identified are your principal co competition. I'll, I'll repeat those. Nashville, Austin, Atlanta, Charlotte. Okay, so not surrounding counties. Not surrounding, But no. other major cities. Correct. Okay. And, and, it, and, and that's what we mean by regional focus. The Tampa Bay region... <gasps> Um, you're competing against the, in a macro sense, you're competing against these other regions which are putting together responses to the regional um, challenges that you face here. Gotcha. It's not that they don't face challenges themselves, but they are, they are uh, moving ahead to solve those challenges. Great, thank challenges. you. Yes. Okay, so I'm and, going to turn it over. I'm sorry, Commissioner Kemp, you recognize. Yes. Thank you. I just uh, wanted to add that we've just recently had a regional I think they call it the regional competitive mm -hmm. study that the Tampa Bay Partnership did, and they identified 19 other regions that we are looking at. Those were, I don't think Nashville was included in that list, I'm not sure, but they did have um, South Florida, Raleigh, Durham, you know, Portland, Seattle. Right. And so I just wanted Denver, I think, um, and I just wanted to point that out because okay. they're really focused on that. That makes that perfect list. sense. Mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll only comment. I was in Nashville just before coming here for a couple of days. 
you need to watch what Nashville is doing because oh I, I'm not oh, doubting you I'm not doubting you I'm just <laughs> I'm just pointing out and it might even be in that list I'm just not sure I just wanted to make okay. sure because this just came out in the last few weeks excellent so. good okay so I'm, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Dan Conway who's going to speak with you about uh, uh, market and uh, economic data thank you Alan and good morning commissioners and stakeholders it's very nice to be here this morning uh, a lovely day in Tampa uh, I'm Dan Conway I'm with the firm of THK Associates and I'm an urban land economist uh, and have been practicing for about 50 years now so um, I'm going to talk to you this morning about some of the socioeconomic growth factors that the commissioners should be aware of and their impacts on uh, the region and the study area that we're going to be talking about. Metropolitan Tampa is booming again, and the area includes the four counties of Hillsborough, Hernando, Pasco, and Pinellas. This growth is taxing infrastructure, and today <clears throat> the metro area has just under 3 million people and about 1.5 million housing units. Through 2040, the Tampa region will grow by 890,000 people in 364,000 housing units. <coughs> Hillsborough County's growth will occur in the real estate, finance, and insurance sectors, along with professionals, technical, healthcare, and social assistance sectors. Hillsborough County currently has almost 1.4 million people in about 640,000 housing units, and annually the county is projected to grow by 9,800 housing units, and by 2040, Hillsborough County will grow by over 568,000 people and about 225,000 housing units. Metropolitan Tampa has about 183 million square feet of industrial space and 99 million square feet are in Hillsborough County. Of the total industrial market, about 12.6% is research and development square footage. It is projected that Metropolitan Tampa will enjoy an annual industrial market of about 5.2 million square feet per year, and Hillsborough County's industrial market will be for 2.7 million square feet per year, with 535,000 square feet likely to be research and development. Through 2040, Hillsborough County will need land for 61.5 million square feet of industrial space, of which 12.3 million square feet will be R&D. Hillsborough County, to meet the need through 2040, will require 3,530 acres of industrial land, of which 710 acres will be R&D land, and 45% or 325 acres will have a preponderance to locate in the environs of the study area. Metropolitan Tampa's office market includes almost 148 million square feet and Hillsborough County has about 124 million square feet. The Metropolitan Tampa office market is projected to grow annually by 3.1 million square feet and 1,650,000 square feet are projected to locate in Hillsborough County. Through 2040, Hillsborough County will require 3,485 acres for office space and 18% or about 645 acres should locate in the environs of the study corridor. Metropolitan Tampa will need to add approximately 1.2 million square feet of retail space per year and 750,000 square feet annually will occur in Hillsborough County. 
through 2040, uh, Hillsborough County will need approximately 2,000 acres of retail commercial with 150 acres <clears throat> demanded in the environs of the study corridor. In total, Hillsborough County to meet the industrial, office, retail, and commercial markets through 2040 will need 9,015 acres and just over 12% or 1,120 acres will be needed in the environs of the study corridor. Residentially, the four county metro Tampa area is projected to grow by 15,820 residential units per year. Hillsborough County is expected to capture 9,800 units per year, including 2,900 rental apartments, 1,300 townhomes and condominiums, and 5,600 detached single family. To accommodate this residential demand in Hillsborough County through 2040, will require 38,525 acres. 15% of the higher density residential unit demand will have a preponderance for a location in the study corridor. In total, Hillsborough County will need 47,540 acres to meet the 2040 projected growth. This projected need is in stark contrast to the amount of developable land in the urban service area. Hillsborough County has 682,660 acres of land with 382,491 acres outside the urban service area and 300,169 acres in the urban service area. Of these total lands, the county has 155,759 acres that are greenfield developable and 26,888 acres of this developable land are in the three cities and the unincorporated area. This comparison of the need for 47,540 acres of developable land far exceeds the 26,888 acres available in the three cities as well as the unincorporated Hillsborough County, and it far surpasses the 19,323 acres of developable land in the unincorporated Hillsborough County. The need is twice the size of our study area and 210 neighborhoods with the equivalent land area encompassing 10 football fields with 50 units each will be needed each year through the year 2040. In fact, unincorporated Hillsborough County has enough greenfield developable land in its unincorporated urban service area to accommodate approximately nine years of development activity. And this period could be shorter given the remaining developable areas appropriateness for specific land use types. The Urban Land Institute panel will recommend that Hillsborough County should hold the existing urban service area boundary line for at least the next five years. The county should anticipate enlarging its urban service area after that time, and to accomplish this, the planning should begin immediately. It should be noted <laughs> that to accommodate the entire demand in the greenfield developable acreage in the urban service area of the three cities as well as unincorporated incorporated Hillsborough County, the densities of the residential development would have to nearly double to 40 units per acre for rental apartments, 20 units per acre for the townhome and condominiums, and eight units per acre for the detached single family. Realizing these trends, the planners will now demonstrate 
planning concepts that could be used to accommodate some of this projected growth in our study area. All right, well, thanks very much, Dan. Um, my name is Laura Bonich. I am a civil engineer. I have a specialty in sustainability as it relates to kind of the horizontal built environment. And so the good news is that all those numbers that you just heard are A, going to be in a report, right? And B, you can get this right afterwards as well, which is kind of the highlights. So the takeaway from what Dan said was he looked at all four counties, right? Then he looked at Hillsborough County. And then what was buried in those numbers was how much the study area needs. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the study area and what percentages. So he did lots of analysis, lots of numbers to get us down to what wants to be here, right? So I'm going to talk about what wants to be here and then what we're going to recommend ends up being here. So the study area was generally, we've got a big dashed line there that you can see on this exhibit just so we're kind of all know where we're at. Um, so the first thing we did was think about what different scenarios we're going to look at. And I'm going to talk about a couple of those, and then my colleagues are going to talk about some of the others. So the first thing we did is what we're calling a maximum capacity analysis. That says if we built out the 21,500 acres in the study area, what would that look like? Again, that's only half the land that Dan said you need by 2040. Remember, he said you need 47,000 acres if it was all going to be greenfield. The second thing we did is we looked at some very strategic economic development nodes. Those would be targeted for employment in, and housing. And you're <coughs> going to see in the results that that's going to take about 10% of the study area, or about 2,200 acres. We're going to recommend that you preserve the other 90% of the study area as um, existing rural, residential, and open space. The other thing that you're going to hear, and this is the big takeaway here, is that we're saying that for now you need to really hold the line. And we say hey, hold the line that is the existing urban services area. That for five to eight years, the emphasis should really be on development within the existing urban services boundary to promote increased density and sustainable best practices. So quickly on the maximum capacity analysis. So this is the about 21,500 acres that are outside the MSA, excuse me, the USA, and also outside Temple Terrace and Plant City. So you got Plant City's boundary on one side, the city and Temple Terrace on the other side, and then the existing urban service area for Hillsborough County and the gray kind of below. So when we looked at that, we said that about 30% of the 21,000 acres would be set aside for wetlands and open space, and about another 20% for parks, schools, roads, and other things that you need when you develop an area. All right, so that gets us to 12,000 developable acres. So this is the maximum analysis. So based on 12,000 acres, we could put 170,000 people here, which is about 30% of the 2040 growth, and we could put about 100,000 jobs here, which would be 20% of the jobs demand in 2040. Okay, so that's the capacity analysis of the land. If again you love numbers like Dan and I, um, you can see what the assumptions are here, and I'll let you look at those in detail later if you want to download the slides, but this is how we came to the 100,000 um, employees, 65,000 units, and about 70, 170,000 people, <coughs> again on 12,000 acres. All right, so from that, um, you know, I want to be clear, <laughs> we're not recommending that. <coughs> and the, one of the big reasons we're not re recommending that goes back to what Alan said, which is the existing density in the urban services area is only about 1.3 units per acre. That is amazingly low on almost any scale and really says that a bunch of additional development capacity exists. A lot of that would probably need to be redevelopment. We think there's value in preserving the unique rural character and natural features. We think that, that if you did allow this area to develop, you'd really just end up with sort of a generic anywhere suburban development pattern, which I don't think is what anyone wants. And it really doesn't support sustainable development practices. So an alternative is to look at some strategic economic development nodes. Those are shown here in pink. Um, the guy who likes to color made them a little bit <laughs> extra big so they'd show, but that's really only 10% of the 21,500 acres. So you can see that those would be phased in three very distinct nodes. Again, 2,200 acres, about 10% of the total area. 
And then what we did is we said, of those jobs that Dan talked about, if we just took the targeted industries, so that is the office that wants to be here, the retail that wants to be here, and the commercial that wants to be here, we would have 57,000 jobs. We are recommending no industrial, so no distribution, no warehousing. This is just targeted jobs. The other thing we said was, if we were gonna provide one housing unit for every two jobs, how many housing units would that take? <coughs> that's that's 83,000. Um, units, we said those would all be attached. So either apartments, condominiums, or multifamily. So no single family development in those nodes. So these are very compact, jobs oriented with multifamily housing. Again, here's the table that shows you what the assumptions were to get to those numbers. You could have 57,000 employees, about 33,000 people living there on 10% of the study area land. So again, just to reiterate, acreage for 100% of the targeted jobs that would want to be here, one <coughs> attached housing unit for every two jobs, preservation of 90% of the land in between. Um, we think this leverages the existing transportation network and you're gonna hear a little bit more about that and that it would make sense to extend water and sewer for these areas. So with that, I will let Drew tell you a little bit more about it. Thanks, Laura. So L Laura gave you a good overview of kind of what we need to fit in this area. I'm gonna go into uh, where we are thinking that fits in a little bit more detail. So m my name's Drew Watkins. I'm a architect, uh, urban designer, planner uh, in Southern California. And I've worked on a lot of master plan communities uh, in urban revitalization. Um, so these are those three nodes, those strategic economic development nodes uh, that uh, 2,160 acres of potential greenfield development that we could get outside of the existing USA. Um, as Laura said, each of these nodes is oversized. Uh, there's a lot of wetlands, and so we're assuming that in, in some of these nodes, you know, we might only get 50% of development. Uh, in some of the nodes, we, we might get closer to you know, 75, 80%, uh, depending on some of the constraints. Uh, the nodes build off of existing infrastructure, both the existing highway corridors, I-4 particularly, uh, but also I-75, uh, using the existing interchanges, and we've explored one additional interchange actually up on I-75 uh, for a couple different reasons, which we'll uh, get into a little later. Uh, and so building off of transportation uh, and also utility service. There's actually, you know, even though the, there's a USA boundary, there's actually some utility service, particularly uh, potable water uh, that exists outside of that USA, and so we want to uh, take advantage of that uh, wherever we can. Um, each node is also very dense. Uh, Laura referred to kind of there's no single family uh, development here, so we're creating very dense development, uh, and we're concentrating that in a walk uh, radius, so kind of a one-mile walk radius, pedestrian-friendly, compact uh, neighborhoods uh, that will lend themselves very well to uh, future transit possibilities. Uh, so the first area, this is located kind of along uh, I-75, right north of I-4, right by the executive airport. Uh, it would be uh, holding approximately 400 acres of greenfield development. Uh, this area is heavily impacted by wetlands, and so that's why it's kind of a bigger area uh, in total, but only we're only trying to get 400 acres in here. Uh, and this results in a kind of a split in acreage, 200 acres for, for employment, 200 for residential. You get about 10,000 jobs uh, and 6,000 residents or so. Uh, this accommodates about a four-year build-out. Uh, one of the benefits of, of having a development here uh, is that you could potentially leverage this to create a new interchange uh, that would give better access to the executive airport and start to structure uh, some access to future development uh, outside of the USA to the east. Uh, it's also, this is the one that's really surrounded by utility service, so kind of the, the uh, cheapest to kind of get stuff on the land. Area two, moving east, uh, so this is just north of the 579 interchange off of I-4. Uh, it would be at the intersection of that interchange, uh, the uh, 579, uh, and I believe it's Pruitt uh, that we would connect to from I-75. Uh, and this is about 800 acres, so about twice the development size of the, the last uh, uh, area. Uh, and this is because this area is not as impacted by wetlands, a lot more developable land here. Uh, it accommodates, uh, again, about twice the size of jobs, 20,000 jobs, uh, over 12,000 residents, uh, and would accommodate an eight-year build-out. 
Uh, this area is also adjacent to utility service, so there would certainly need to be, uh, you know, quite an extension into this area, but, it, but it's not far off. The last area is the furthest one out. Uh, this is uh, 960 acres. It's also the largest, uh, 24,000 jobs, almost 15,000 residents, accommodating a 10-year build-out. So if you kind of take those build-outs uh, backwards, there was a 4, an 8, and a 10, about 22 years of build-out, that gets us to that 2040 uh, date. Uh, <coughs> this would access, this would take access uh, off of I-4 around Macintosh. Uh, so what is the character of these? It's important to remember that these are dense developments. Again, no single family, uh, detached development. Uh, the benefit is that we're preserving a lot of land, right? So we're only using 10% of our study area uh, for development. So that's preserving 90% uh, of unincorporated land. Uh, that also allows us to, that density also allows us to preserve a lot of the uh, existing residential uh, and wetlands within uh, that, those areas. Uh, this, you know, pedestrian oriented development uh, transit ready, right, that density uh, allows for uh, potential future transit, and it also is a great opportunity for placemaking. Commissioner White, you're recognized. This is probably a fine-tuned detail that'll come later. It's probably not appropriate, um, not necessarily appropriate uh, for this forum, but I, I feel compelled to mention it anyway. Um, on that McIntosh Road corridor, you have a high school with a magnet component, so people converge on that school from every direction in a, in a, in a, in a, from a large geographic area. So, you know, as, as we wade into this, if, if we get to that point, we might want to engage leadership at the school district to see, you know, if they might be willing to relocate that magnet component perhaps to a different school. And, and I know that would be tough, but because, you know, that school, you know, now has a culture of, of, of having, of being the home of that magnet program. But <clears throat> I just, I see that as a, as a potential challenge, so. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Drew, and um, good morning. I note your brief rainstorm, and it is brief in my book, reminds me that I'll be headed home to Seattle tonight. <laughs> um, I'm Ross Tillman. I'm a transportation planning consultant in Seattle. I work there and around the country, and I'm pleased to be with you this morning. So Drew talked about the, um, the idea of developing those concentrated nodes in locations where you can tap into and build on existing infrastructure, including transportation infrastructure. So I want to talk about the transportation strategy to support that type of development. And the challenge here is how to capture the value of that regional crossroads, I-4 and I-75. It is perhaps the most prominent transportation infrastructure in the region. and. Um, puts this part of the county very much on the map, accessible from all points of the compass. So again, it's where regional traffic meets, but that's not how regional traffic actually gets to any uh, land in this area. That occurs from adjacent interchanges, and those are anywhere where from one to four miles from this crossroad. So I emphasize this crossroads and then these area interchanges that actually create the access. And then once you're at the interchange, you get onto local arterial streets uh, to head to your destination, and that's how you open up development areas. So the development nodes want to take advantage of that form and structure. What you have right now, particularly around that I-475 crossroads, is only about half the picture. Yes, there is some access to the north, but Right now, the current structure really favors those areas uh, to the south of I-4. And indeed, this is what the existing street, highway, and interchange scenario looks like. Um, again, the arterial streets primarily on the south side. So the panel recommends early steps to prepare for nodal development in this area is to build out, upgrade some of the existing roads, particularly on the north side of I-4. And then to make selective additions, extending arterial streets so that you create a real grid network. Um, so again, supporting the nodal development. The advantage of this grid is that it better distributes traffic. 
you can't load all of these hundreds of acres from just one or two facilities. It won't work well. It also facilitates transit access. It sets up a framework that also helps pedestrian and bicycle access. Of course, there would be local access streets within those arterials, but it takes the existing pattern that already exists, roughly one mile spacing, and simply fills in the gaps. <coughs> And as I said, that same street system supports <coughs> the extension of transit to these new development areas. It makes sense because one, the density of those areas would justify transit service <coughs> quite readily. Transit will be important to increase access to new jobs in these areas and for the people who live there to seek jobs, education, other destinations um, elsewhere using transit. So it increases mobility options. Um, for new and existing residents. That's the view of the 2040 feature, future, the next 25 years. Now Jordan is going to talk about the early years and how you step in to this situation. Thanks, Ross. I'm going to do my best to try to talk to the audience but also speak loud enough into the microphone so you could hear. I see that's been a challenge for some people. I'm also a little taller than some of the rest of the group, so I'm trying to bend down. Uh, <laughs> I'm Jordan Block. Uh, I'm an urban designer and a planner from Denver, Colorado. Uh, so I want to start talking about what we could do kind of in early phases. Some of the development scenarios, sort of the strategic vision you just saw laid out, is looking at that, that 25, 23-year uh, scape. I want to talk about what you want to start looking at in the next five to eight years. And we think that this approach looks at holding the existing urban service area. And I should say that when we say the USA, we don't mean the country, we mean the urban service area. I just want to make that sure that that's clear. <laughs> uh, so this is consistent with the last 30 years of, of land use decisions, but we want to make it clear that we're not recommending a no action plan. And you'll see what I mean by that as I kind of go through my slides. What you have, as Dan pointed out, is a really limited stock of greenfield land, so undeveloped land within the area. So what this means is you have to start looking at other assets, opportunities for redevelopment and reuse of underutilized land. What this means for you, and you've heard this word a lot, is, is density. And I know this is a four-letter word for some people, but we want to make sure that we're expressing that this is not supposed to be scary, this is supposed to be an asset. Um, what, what more people in a compact area means is you get the sort of amenities we heard people want. Grocery stores, better retail environments, cultural institutions, and community gathering spaces. Uh, here's a few uh, kind of places around the area that you might recognize that sort of speak to the sort of places we like to talk about and, and, and hope you guys can create. In Baldwin Park in Orlando and uh, Dunedin just to the north. But well, what density brings is sort of a taxing of your existing infrastructure system. I mean sort of a challenging of your infrastructure system. Well, you heard that your commute on I-4, if you use that, is already challenged. Uh, so what we need to express is that you need to start thinking about mobility differently. You have to start thinking about it outside of the automobile. That's, you know, everyone driving in their own car to and from work or to and from their, their errands. What uh, compact development promotes is active transportation, people walking, people biking, in addition to driving and other things. Uh, the county has already invested a lot of, of resources and energy into building out walking and biking infrastructure, but what a lot of people in a smaller area do is, is maximize that investment and unlock its potential. Similarly, transit becomes an opportunity. Uh, I know there's been some talk of transit in the area. Right now, it might not be feasible, but in the future, it's absolutely feasible. This could look a number of different ways. This could be bus rapid transit, which is sort of like a, <coughs> a bus that looks and feels more like a train. Light rail potentially down the line. We also want to express that autonomous vehicles are, are coming. We don't know exactly what the impact looks like, but it could be substantial uh, to the urban fabric. So it's something to think about. But the main takeaway here is that when you start thinking about your mobility pattern in the corridors, that you think about these things early. Even if they're not feasible now, you can't preclude them later. Uh, what we really want to drive home about density and these sort of vibrant places we're talking about is that it's an economic development tool. We talked a lot about economic development. You'll hear more about that uh, in detail. But what great places do is they attract talent. Talent attracts employers and, and the sorts of jobs we heard that the county wants, and that brings economic vibrancy. Uh, a great example is sort of outside of my hometown of Denver. Uh, 
right by a transit station. It's called Bellevue Station. It's a very suburban area, or traditionally has been. They started investing in some of this density and this place-making opportunity. And what that attracted was a lot of new people, really smart people. And what that attracted in turn was uh, Western Union moving their headquarters directly on site to, to be closer to the transit and to be closer to those people. Uh, with with kind of holding the line on the urban services area, there's a few things to consider. Uh, one is that land value within t internal to the, the boundary will increase. This is both kind of an opportunity and a challenge for everyone. The opportunity is that the land value increases and that means more tax revenue on, on sort of higher value property and that can help uh, the county and, and some of the service they want to provide. The challenge is that can also exacerbate affordability. Uh, so we, we really ask that the county look at uh, opportunities to make sure they preserve their affordab affordable housing stock. Uh, one thing that density can do, though, is provide sort of a mix of different sizes of units, and those could range from much more affordable to more expensive. So it could be opportunity there as well. Another thing to consider is that 600,000 new people moving into the area, they'll use a lot of water over the next 23 years as those people fill in and then beyond. Uh, one thing we want to talk about is, is a possibility, and we're recommending the possibility of mandating a retrofit of, of older homes, rentals and owners, uh, multifamily and single family, to retrofit their fixtures, toilets and shower heads and the like, uh, towards low flow options. It sounds like small, um, small potatoes kind of when you say it, but it, it, its impact can be huge. We think that it could save somewhere along the lines of 6.6 .6 billion gallons of water, which is enough water for one third of the new development that's expected and the new growth expected to occur here. The good news is, and we want to applaud the county and the area, uh, you are already leading the nation in, in low water use. So we think that's amazing. We just wanted to call that out. Sorry. Another challenge is that development will not cease outside the urban service area, even if you hold the line. The, continue, the patterns that you see right now, they'll continue to, to happen. Again, this is both an opportunity and a challenge. The opportunity is that it preserves sort of the character of the communities that you've all come to love out there for those of you who live there or those of you who visit there. The sort of that rural, um, natural and open sort of feeling. The challenge is the low density development that's happening as it continues to occur will put strains on your existing infrastructure, including transportation like I-4. Uh, so uh, another uh, concern is that, that all this development uses septic systems and well systems. And septic systems could have long-term impacts on the quality of your groundwater and your drinking water. Um, so one thing we want to recommend is studying the idea of potentially uh, putting a moratorium on the growth of development permits with septic systems, something to study. Uh, and lastly, the visions you saw need to be uh, possible by not making it so you can't do them later by kind of sprawling and, and kind of continuing in the existing development patterns. So over the next five to eight years, we want to call out some homework, I guess you could call it for everyone. Uh, there's three priorities we want to call out. It's over the next five to eight years, but they all start right now. One is to find and promote these re redevelopment and infill uh, opportunities on under underutilized land internal to the USA. Another is to create a vision for what you want to see when you finally do talk about expanding the USA. And the last is to look for uh, alternative revenue sources or strengthen the ones you have. So just in a little bit more detail. Uh, the county currently has a competitive sites program, which we think is great, that highlights uh, quality sites for development. We think that this needs to be refocused to start looking at these redevelopment and infill opportunities and work with property owners to do that. A great opportunity, something to consider, an area to look at is a Sefner Mango area, in particular along Martin Luther King uh, at 579 or, or Mango. Uh, they have a current overlay, and we think that this is a good opportunity to start strengthening the sort of vision that the community wants to see along this sort of downtownish area, but also align it with the visions of the county and the growth that, that we're going to see in the next, uh, you know, 23 or so years. And then also start using some innovative funding techniques to maybe make this happen, and, and we'll hear more about that in a minute. So this might be one vision. This is a, a sketch that shows what this could kind of look like. Uh, what we, what we want to point out is that it sort of is in line with the community area plan for Sefner Mango. So this is that area again. Uh, it, it ties to transit. It, it strengthens the, the sort of the downtown area that we heard has sort of been hurt in recent years, especially by trucking. Um, and it also used that overlay district to create the sort of place uh, that, that we think that could make sense in an area like this. Um, moving on, the second priority that I mentioned was planning for growth. If you're expanding the urban service area, you want a solid vision of what that needs to look like starting now. And what that means is working with the communities, not 
just the ones in the room, but everyone, and making sure that you have a shared vision that's owned by everyone. Uh, so the final outcome is a document or a, a, a plan that everyone is proud of and everyone believes in. The final priority is to look for new sources and strengthen old sources of revenue. I won't go into these too, in too much detail. My colleague Molly will, will speak more in detail to them in just a minute. <coughs> but the, the key is that any funding, uh, any revenue source, needs to not only pay for the sort of infrastructure you need to build now, but fund it ongoing as maintenance is needed down the line. Lastly, uh, you're expanding the urban service area potentially down the road that needs to be planned out, but you also <coughs> might need to look at it again over and over throughout many, many years from now. And I think there needs to be a schedule for looking at that. Uh, Portland is a good example. Uh, the state of Oregon mandates that they look at it every six years and study do they need to expand their urban growth boundary, do they not, what does it mean to, what is our vision for it. The city of Portland says, no, we need to do it every three years because this is really important. And they go out and they meet with the community and they work together to come up with a vision. So this first phase approach, so to speak, of holding the line, holding the urban service area is crucial for a few key reasons. One is the lowest cost option for, for accommodating a lot of this early growth that you're going to see over the next five to eight years. It maximizes the investment you've all, the county has already made in infrastructure. It promotes a sense of place that is uh, more vibrant and economically competitive, and it promotes a sort of sustainability develop and development patterns uh, that promote things like better mobility and placemaking. Thanks. Molly? Thanks, Jordan. Uh, as opposed to Jordan, I'm actually on the uh, shorter stature, so I think hopefully <laughs> the microphone is hitting me at the right place. So my name is Molly McCabe. Uh, I'm a principal at Hayden Tanner, a real estate advisory firm focused on investment uh, with a niche focus on capturing sustainability and resilience within the value premise. Uh, I actually live in Big Fork, Montana, so again, like all of us, come from a very different location. As you can tell from my colleagues' comments, this is not a no-action recommendation. What we're really telling you is to make a bold move to create place and to value what you already have. As a country, we have been falling in love with communities again. We don't want to be anywhere USA on the highway. And so true communities are walkable, vibrant, and connected, and they take advantage of the resources that we have. Oh, did you just do that for me? Thank you. Um, at the same time, Every community is vulnerable in some way, whether that's to natural or man-made hazards. These hazards are extreme events, as you've directly experienced recently, include floods and storms, major infrastructure failures, as well as other crises, population growth, and so forth. There is evidence that real estate owners in many areas are beginning to factor in na these natural hazard risks, as well as investment risks, into their d investment decisions. ULI has studied how communities and property owners who take resilience into consideration fare over the long haul. And I won't go into all of these factors, but a few of them I think are particularly important and tied directly to the comments that we've made. First off, strengthen job and housing choices. Cities with a broad range of jobs and housing alternatives are by nature more resilient. Leverage community assets. Identify and build from your existing assets, whether that's related to geography, your economy, local skills, or community leadership. This enables communities, and your community in particular, to be more prepared to bounce back after certain disruptions. Land use decisions do lock in permanent systemic relationships, and those are either inherently resilient or they exacerbate the problem. Redefine how and where to build. Increasing urbanization is more efficient. And it's where changing demographics are driving their desire to live, and it's ultimately where jobs are found. Lastly, harness innovation and technology. We know things are changing. There's great opportunity to utilize those changes in the short, ter short term that don't preclude the long term. Christine's going to share with you our thoughts on how these specific things relate to economic development and ongoing vibrancy, and I'll come back and speak to you about specific financing structures shortly. So, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. So those of you who met with me earlier this week realized that this is an amazing improvement in my voice. <laughs> um, on interview day, I couldn't speak at all. So I apologize to those of you who had to meet with me. I'm, uh, I'm Christine Richmond. 
I'm a principal at an architecture and design firm in Salt Lake City, Utah. I am an economic development planner, and so I'm here today to talk to you about how economic development strategies fit into the implementation of the strategy that you've heard laid out for you today. <coughs> um, first, I want to start countywide. So there are several things that you can do with your economic development uh, approach on a countywide basis that will help you implement this strategy in the study area, but will also help address how you move forward with the countywide issues that are coming at you. And as we know, if you don't plan, you're probably going to, it's going to cost, probably going to cost you more and you're going to end up somewhere you don't actually want to go. Um, so first we're recommending that your existing plans and strategies be more closely aligned, that they work in concert together so that as you move forward, the comprehensive plan and the economic development strategy are speaking the same language. Um, so uh, we're also recommending that everything be updated and put in plain language so that it's easier for everybody to understand and it's easier to find what it is that you're looking for in the documents. Uh, we are recommending that you take a look at the criteria to expand the urban services area boundary and tie in economic development criteria and metrics so that you can measure success of those expansions as you go forward and it, that it gives very clear direction for w why it is that you are expanding the boundary and what you expect to get from it. We are recommending that you update your economic development strategy. It was done in 2010 and it needs to be brought into now. Uh, demographics have changed, site selection criteria have changed, you've changed. Uh, so the strategy needs to be brought up to date. Um, we also recommend that you put a, a more specific geographic element into that economic development strategy. It talks about geography on a large scale area, sort of 30,000 foot level. Uh, we're recommending something more on the neighborhood level, something in between where it is today and your competitive sites program so that you have an idea of, of how do you create the places where R&D um, users really want to be because they want certain things around them. So let's make sure we're, we're creating the right landing zones for those types of uses. And we're also recommending that you update your regional competitiveness uh, measures so that you're measuring specifically and tracking specifically quality of life measures. We heard from many of you that your biggest competitive advantage is quality of life, so measure it and track it and make it part of the <coughs> overall conversation when you're thinking about economic development steps and strategies. So those things will help the specific um, study area as well as the overall county approach. But we also want to talk about how that applies in this specific study area. So the strategy creates nodes, nodes of um, activity, nodes of investment. Um, they're designed to create enough area to, to be self-sustaining and to contain a critical mass of uses and value to attract the private investment that you need to help you move forward. The strategy assumes that you will actively recruit for, for development partners and for end users in these areas and that you'll hold out so that you can get the right partner. Um, so that you're not moving forward with something that doesn't actually get you where you want to end up, that you're finding the right people to travel through this with. Um, and the plan also assumes that it will ro roll out over time as growth occurs in the region. You've heard a number of us talk about we're assuming that you're going to hold the line for the next five to eight years expand the boundary for the first node, start planning for the second node, expand, you know, so this is going to happen sequentially and you're going to plan for each of those rollouts before it happens. And those plans should take you, you know, five to eight to ten years so that you're getting it right and you're finding the right partners and you're figuring out the best way to finance the plan because as we all know, um, growth comes with a cost. Um, and so Molly's going to come back up here and talk to you a little bit about how you put those plans together. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. I think you stole my thunder. My slide says, growth comes with a cost. <laughs> <laughs> so you can either start planning and paying for it now or you can pay for it exponentially later. 
You're currently in a no tax, no spend environment for a variety of reasons, including you know the Great Recession, and we get that. But right now, essentially what's happening is you're effectively robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're running at a deficit. You can't only pay for your capital costs. You also need to cover your ongoing operating expenses. Your unfunded and underfunded infrastructure needs that you currently have are hamstringing your ability to invest in the future. And this will be exacerbated by the likely passage, uh, I think as we all expect, of the homestead exemption um, in 2018. The county should be applauded for the progress you've made in addressing these unfunded deficiencies through the passage of the 2016 transportation funding. This was an important start to remedying the shortfall. However, that also is unsustainable and does not support long-term growth and economic prosperity. These fiscal pressures still affect the development of new public services and infrastructure, creating the need for new sources of revenue. And how you pay for those long-term services are critical to community health vitality, property value, and economic prosperity. That transfer of those seven and eight, seven to eight cents of the ad valorem property tax will impact other county services broadly because you're pulling it out of what you're are currently using it for. So those other services are also at risk. So we need to take another look at how we fund these kinds of things. So the good news is you're not alone. This is happening all over the place. Suburban development plans uh, in communities because of the sprawl, it's more, more difficult for local governments to balance their budgets. But what we're recommending, no surprise, is that new development should pay its own way. This is not about, this is not about you know, just the developers. This means we need to right size the cost of doing business. Impact fees should fully co cover the additional cost of financing public facilities to the beneficiaries of those new facilities. As a practical matter, impact fees get pulled into the residual value of the land. This adds value to the property. This needs to be accounted for. So the panel recommends that impact fees be adjusted so that the new growth defrays the cost and that growth's impact on vital services. Next, incentivize your vision. And dis disincentivize things that are not in alignment. The, the Board of Commissioners um, passed a, a uh, guiding principles, your, your guiding <laughs> principles, <laughs> guiding principles. Align your vision with that. Make decisions that are in alignment with that. Metric and measure every decision you make against those five guiding principles. Don't go outside of that. So for example, when you're looking at projects that might be pushing the urban services boundary, say, how does this fit with those five guiding principles? We recommend that you actually put specific metrics and measurements around those so that you do have a means of evaluating that and leverage your existing resources. It's no surprise development has to make sense, financial sense. It's not going to be financed. It's not going to be invested in if it doesn't make money. That's the practical reality. That said, the county already has a wide variety of tools available to make this happen, probably far more than you realize. This is you know, not even an exhausted list of things that are currently available or could potentially be available. Public-private partnerships are often the most effective means of deploying large-scale new investment and redevelopment in communities. You're already using tax increment financing. You already have the ability and in places are using community development districts. There are new opportunities as related to transportation improvement bonds where it's sort of a design, build, manage, maintain, where it's a revenue sharing with the entity that is partnering with you. But really what, what you want to do, know is sort of what are some other things that might be possible. I've thrown in here a couple of things, community benefit agreements and programs, ways to partner with your community members, um, community land trusts. How about crowdfunding? You know, one of the things we looked at as, as opportunity is how do you layer different financing strategies? So for example, Jordan talked about the Sefner Mango Plan. What if you layered certain financing structures in, 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 that, in that overlay? What if you included a, some, tax some TIF monies, tax increment financing? What if you put together some sort of a community benefit district? What if the community wanted to crowdfund, I don't know, uh, an arbor or a park or a, a community kiosk, 
Maybe you could crowdfund that from your local community. Or maybe you can use sort of tactical urbanism where the city can, or the county can actually give the community the opportunity to pilot a few things by adjusting their, short, adjusting some of their requirements just for a period of time to see if it works and see how it catalyzes. So you have a variety of different options. Recognize that you can utilize all of them. That said, you need to be able to simplify how these things get done. And I'm going to ask Kazi to come up and talk about how you can actually make these things easier and quickly move through these so that you can get to market quickly. Commissioner White, you recognize. If I may just, just ask a, a quick question. Um, you know, these, these community plans are kind of um, strange creatures. They're, they're, they're sort of embedded in our comp plan. They, they really don't have a lot of teeth from a regulatory perspective. Um, they're oftentimes uh, written in a way that's sort of aspirational in nature. Um, and, and when you mention overlay, you know, we certainly do have the ability in the county to uh, apply something like a zoning overlay district in an area. That, that would add more specificity and, and, um, um, and, and, and really uh, give, uh, give us a, a, a regulatory tool that really does have, have some teeth to it. So, I mean, would you, do you think that's a, a good idea in these areas where we have these community plans to, to move forward with a, a more a solid, something like a zoning overlay district that adds that specificity? The panel talked about that, and I think that type of thing makes sense within contextually with the community members and to as it relates to sort of some development that actually fits within what your desired outcomes are. And there are fiscal impacts to that, and we did talk about that, and I think one of the key criteria is to do that evaluation of what those kinds of things actually mean from a fiscal or economic perspective. Perfect. Thanks. I'm sure. Um, Mr. Chris, you're recognized. Thank you. I, the way I took it, and, and, and I had the opportunity to meet with you when you, you were one of the ones that interviewed me, is that what I understood from what you were saying is that the community plans was a good place to start with the vision of what kind of look this development area could take that would fit in sync with the community's <coughs> vision of what they want to look like. But I also, what I took away from you, and, and I could be wrong, is that any new development could jumpstart and feed that community plan that's currently sitting on the shelf and collecting dust, especially if we utilized a TIF on that node, any new revenues generated from increased property values, of which there would be dramatically, could jumpstart and, and actually put on steroids all of the measures in most of the community plans. It, it, did, I, did I understand you correctly? Go ahead. Yeah, you, I, you did understand me correctly. I think the one piece that I would make clear is I think it needs to be contextually consistent with the desires of whatever is dis, you know, determined within that community, but absolutely. I'll, I'll add something to that. The, um, going back to Molly's point about it has to be, it has to make financial sense because a, a TIF isn't a magic bullet. It can make things happen that wouldn't happen otherwise to fill what we call the capital stack. Um, but the, uh, it still has to fund, all of those improvements have to make financial sense, either in terms of public benefit, which means that public financing takes a preponderance of the financing piece, not all of it, but a preponderance, or private benefit, which means that the real estate community is going to come in and create an asset. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I think Molly alluded to, you're going to hear in a moment, I'm not, I don't want to uh, steal Kazi Thunder, but it's pertinent to this question, is that when you are making those plans, the community plans, when the planning commission is making plans, there has to be a fiscal overlay to that. Mm -hmm. You know, It has to make economic sense, because it doesn't make sense to make plans that can't be executed. And that's why everyone has to participate in the process 
uh, not, not just the community, not just county officials, but the real estate community, the people who are creating these assets as well, need to participate in those plans, which means that people need to be prepared to compromise because nobody's going to get everything they want. At the end of the day, that plan should have a focus on being executable from whatever source that is, including the ones that are And sustainable. Right. And, sustainable, and sustainable, which is which is not necessarily the same thing, right? No, no, they're and not, but they're right. both important. Right. Most yes. of the community plans are so very old now. I don't think we've had a new one since in 15 years or longer. We've updated five, them. Five years. Well, they're not, only, they're not only dated, but they were never done with the consideration of a, of a financial impact. They didn't have the financial overlay, nor did the county staff work alongside in the preparation of Well, they were, those. they were developed by the yeah. Planning Commission. Exactly. Without respect to any consideration of how to pay for it. Right. So I think that's, we have to consider a lot of factors moving forward, especially given this recommendation. Commissioner White. And I'll make this very brief. But where I was headed with, with my question is, um, uh, you know, we clearly have some community stakeholders here in, in the room, and, and, and I, know, I know all of them, um, and, and I appreciate their activism. Um, there, there are certain, certainly things within these community plans that, uh, that are held uh, near and dear to the, to the, heart, uh, to the hearts of the, the residents of those areas. So my question about something like a zoning overlay district was, was leading to the idea that um, if we set a direction for certain things to happen within a particular community and everyone is in agreement, the county, the planning commission, members of the community, I think with something like a zoning overlay district, maybe that's not the right tool, maybe there's some other tool, but we can add, we can then have the ability to add in that specificity that gives everyone peace of mind that there's not going to be some type of a bait and switch, right? Because there, look, I'm going to be frank that people don't trust government, right? Whether you agree with that or not, it's, it's a fact, right? So we have to demonstrate that there, and I see some heads nodding over here. So, you know, I think it's they important. Heard that a lot. Well, I, I, even before the not trusting government part about the specificity part, I saw some heads nodding, see right there. So, I mean, that, I think if we work together and everyone has peace of mind that there's not going to be a bait and switch, I think that's, I mean, that's, that's leadership. And that's how we move the ball and that's how we advance this community is bringing everyone along with, with a, 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 a deal that's, that's inked that allows everyone you know, to, to move forward with that level of, of comfort. So. Well, I think what they're suggesting is taking that community plan, really taking it to a new level and embedding it into any kind of redevelopment or development effort that's going to go along and then add the financial mechanism to go along with it so that then you have a win-win for everybody. You have a win for the community and a win for, um, you know, future development opportunity and potential. And that's, I, I think that's um, a really good recipe for success for us because I don't want to totally abandon any community plan. They were, um, they've had a lot of, of good things in them over the years. But I do want them, um, I know you have a question, but I really want them to finish their presentation. And we're, um, I think one thing we have to consider is these people are here for a limited time. And we have our opinions about different things of this. We're not going to be able to do that today. There's going to be a forum to do that. Mr. Merrill's going to lay out um, our future timeline. Um, so we need to let them finish their presentation and direct our questions to them. I, I just, I, I was waiting till the end of the presentation to speak, but since community plans came up, I would just like to say that I don't see this as being inconsistent with the community plans. I see it as oh. being consistent right with what people, uh, you know, I was very involved in the Ruskin community plan 15 years ago. I went to all their, lots of their meetings and in the Apollo Beach community plan as I was an aide to a commissioner here. And I think uh, the desires down there were for just the kinds of things that are being said today, walkable, vibrant communities. So I do not see this as being inconsistent. I see I agree. this. So, so I just want to, 
put that out there as being a, a strength and uh, the fact that the community was involved and engaged I think also is a strength that we can build on not a uh, not at conflict and I did Gibsonton and Riverview both of them mm -hmm. sat through every meeting did them all so I understand the value and the foundation so okay let's finish thank you Molly uh, good morning honorable members County Board of Commission madam chair Vice Chair Christ, uh, my name is Kazi Hawk. I'm the zoning administrator and currently employed by the city of Maricopa in Arizona, which is a suburb of Phoenix. I will discuss briefly about the panel's review of public engagement <coughs> and the regulatory framework that you have in place, and I have few suggested recommendation. As the panel was discussing about the overall arching uh, current system of public engagement in the county, we found through the panel's interview with our stakeholder that there needs to be further pro progress made and innovation for the outreach and engagement efforts. <coughs> During the stakeholder meetings, the panel heard that there is a broad perception and an apparent lack of uh, what I would like to call a communication and perhaps uh, trust between the county and the resident and also within the county departments. So this is something that's been because maybe perhaps it's too big a county, too many, too large of area. So there's a lot of variables involved. So those are some of the things you are charged to uh, address because you have those five guiding principles that Molly highlighted. So if you walk through those guiding principles and pick each one of them and see how you are monitoring them, how you are measuring them, and how you are enforcing them, and then take check them off from your list. So based on that, we also found out through uh, our interactions with the stakeholder and staffing that there is a general notion of them versus us and among various levels of county administration. And as a public servant for two, 20 years, I've been through that a lot. So I know I can feel your pain. And I think that that is something that the county currently has been uh, really proactively addressing those issues and have made some progress. And for that, I commend the staff for doing, taking all those proactive steps to make it corrective. And the second thing the panel would like to suggest is to create an uniform policy comprised of guidelines, best practices, to establish how you go about and approach the community issue and how you communicate with them all about all the work that you do, whether it's street widening, whether you're talking about an area plan or you're talking about any special district, you need to come up with a good plan that you can converse with them. And it cannot be different for you know, the commissioners. It cannot be different for the board of supervisors. It cannot be different for the administrator. The message you send to them has to be uniform and consistent. So they all understand in a very simplistic way what the county's message is for and how it ties up to your comprehensive plan, how it ties up to the board of county supervisors, um, strategic goal, if you have one, say economic development strategic goal or any other goals that you may have. And finally, I also want to talk about the public engagement policy should have some sort of um, a written document that you adopt that is, has to be followed by each department, if each unit, including the board, committees, and commission, so everybody is on the same page, how they conduct the county's business in the public realm. So everybody gets a fair share. Uh, moving on uh, to the regulatory framework, there was, in our stakeholder meeting, we also noticed uh, there was some kind of concern about the consistency, the transparency, and the re reliability issue. Uh, and we've, to simplify that, the development approval process uh, that the county currently has 
for example, it was brought to our knowledge that a lot of those plan that's been built over here was done by the planning agency or your planning commission and did not have any financial consideration taken to it. Well, I mean, those are something, you know, that needs to be tightened up. Those holes needs to be secured so that it's a one document that goes through the Board of Counties Commissioner's direction and the process they outlined. It cannot be an independent uh, plan or a policy. It should be one policy that the Board of County Commissioner directs and everybody within this organization follows those rules and regulation. So we recommend uh, most humbly that you create a policy that is countywide and implement it through all the departments, all boards, all committees, and all commissions follow the same rule. How to conduct the meeting when they initiate a new study, or if they have to do an amendment to a study, they all follow the same rules. So the public at large are aware of this process being uniform and being consistent. Further, we also want to encourage the Board of County Commissioners to have joint meetings, maybe by, I mean, uh, by yearly, maybe you can do uh, a quarterly, it depends on how busy you are, but sit down with other boards, committee and commission and let them know your goals and objective for the year. How does it tie up with your fiscal, about, you know, fiscal, uh, what do you wanna call it, plan? If you have a road improvements or if you wanna do some improvements for take up some area plans, Talk to them, sit down with them, and let them know if they can be part of that discussion. And also discuss with them about maybe together create a design guideline. Right now the county doesn't have a design guideline specific to all the built environment, and I think that'd be a good exercise to start off. So sit down with them and you know, in a very non-informal setting have a discussion and maybe perhaps you guys can all come together to create a design guideline for the county. And finally, I want to talk briefly about your uh, permitting system that would help uh, the county move ahead. I know you guys recently uh, acquired uh, this uh, electronic permitting process called ASELA, uh, which is for which I really commend staff and the administration for that. Uh, for, for my, from my own experience, the city of Maricopa in Arizona, it took us two years to get this electronic system up and running. We are 100% paperless. We don't carry these big loads of papers anymore. Everything is done uh, electronically, and we've been able to reduce our review time from 45 to s about 10 days now. So everybody is happy. Uh, they don't even have to come and see us. You know, they do it online. Even they can pay it online, all that <laughs> thing. So one thing I want to forewarn you, as you are dealing with a very brand new system, each software company provides different, you know, features. It's like all the features in your phone. You know, you got to press this to find out what it can do. So this software company won't tell you all the, they won't open up all the features for you. But they can do amazing thing. So you have to have a very inquisitive, and investigative staff out there and say, hey, what are these things? Because after a certain time period, if you don't get the answers immediately, they'll start charging you. Say so that'll be $2,000 to do that. <laughs> and so you need to find those features up front and say, hey, these are our needs. This is what we want to do. This is what I want to convey to my residents what is in this package and what will cost, and are you gonna provide me the support service? Because a lot of time it's very hard to get everybody, all the departments together to get it. So that support service is very important, and I commend, I rather um, recommend you that you keep that in mind when you talk to this company as we're moving forward. With that, I, I think the, from our perspective, the county staff has made real great progress. I commend them for all the good things that we have seen so far, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And uh, with that, I'm open to take any question or I'll invite uh, Alan to come and talk. Okay. 
And that's where we're at in this discussion now is asking the panel questions that you uh, have. No, well, what? I, I have a Oh, you have yeah, the I have conclusion? I, I do. Oh, okay. I, I do have a. <laughs> So I do have a brief. Right. We're close, Just but not it. there yet. We're close. We're, we're, we're close. Yeah. I, I do have one Mr. question White for, for this gentleman. I, I know we're trying to move this along, so I'll keep it brief. I, I'm just really, I'm just looking for an answer that's two minutes or less. Um, <laughs> can you can you tell us um, briefly what you mean by design guidelines? Yes, uh, ma Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner White, uh, d design guidelines is uh, for your physical architectural design guidelines, you know, your street design guidelines. Uh, how do you want to go about that? So that physical design guidelines, I don't believe the county has any document at this time. Uh, it's always proposed, but I think it'll be good to have a standard for each community that you have. Well, uh, ironically, that's something I've been talking with county staff about a great deal. Now, I'm a layperson, so I always say architectural standards. I mean, I, I don't know yeah, if that's the same thing, you know, correct. Same but, difference. But, um, but you, you, would, you would recommend that as part of your, your I recommendation? I think so. I mean, okay. That's what I, we have all wrote, looked at it, and that's missing, and that's not my opinion either. Great. That's what we were talking to the stakeholder. We got that information feedback from them that they would like to see that happen. Absolutely. Well, you. that determines what you look like. I mean, I mean, and I think we're all here about that. So you're going to be the. I'm going to give a, a little bit more flavor up. to that answer because the the, the panel did talk a, a great deal about um, the issue of design guide issue of design guidelines, but the idea of design guidelines. I want to break that into two pieces, um, and we noted in your guiding principles that you gave a shout out to form based controls. Uh, which is a form of design guidelines. It's not the same as architectural standards, but it is a form of guideline. Um, Form-based standards are being used in a lot newly in a lot of locations to try to incent, I'll call it incent, to try to incent good urban design so that buildings aren't placed willy-nilly on lots. They are put on lots in a way that is are consistent with each other and uh, help to create the sense of place that Jordan and Drew were talking about. So that in uh, uh, concert with architectural standards, which are more about materials um, and things like where you have windows, where you don't have windows, how buildings match with each other, um, those two things can be very powerful tools towards the kinds, achieving the kinds of images that we were showing you in terms of look and feel. Okay. Okay, thank you for your sticking with us so far. Um, I, I uh, am just putting up on the screen here a summarization of the recommendations that you've just heard. And I, I want to touch on a few of them um, because uh, there's a thread that runs through these. And the thread is that uh, you're, you're going to get gross growth. You need to anticipate that it's going to come. Um, and it exceeds the ability to accommodate with your, that growth within the county, let alone within the urban service area, with your current densities. So we, we, as I said, we were going to talk about density here. Um, the, the main recommendation of the panel is that you take a phased approach to that. You do have capacity within your urban service area to accommodate somewhere between five and ten years worth of growth, depending on the actual Pa uh, pace that that growth takes place at. Nobody knows what's going to happen to the markets. In the real estate industry, we're very nervous. It's been a very long recovery. We've been on and up for a long time. Everybody at our last national meeting was talking about when is the hammer going to fall. That's the nature of the business we're in. So we know you're going to go through cycles over the next 25 years. But sometime within the next five to 10 years, you're going to be um, able to stay within your existing boundaries. You need to be prepared to revisit those boundaries. Uh, we know that they're somewhat sacred here, but you need to reevaluate that boundary on a regular basis. And you need to, once you have a plan, decide how that boundary might need to move to accommodate future growth. But you need to do it in a planned way. We really want to encourage you to not underestimate the amount of developable land you have. The metrics that we were given were based on developable land. In, Practically every one of our conversations with people in the community were, we're out of land because. And then we were given metrics that consisted only of ag and vacant land. 
that is not developable land to a real estate developer. Developable land to a real estate developer is this property in relation to the market is being underutilized, okay? Especially within its existing zoning constraints, this property is being underutilized. That's an opportunity that you should examine and include in your calculations about how much space you actually can fit within the urban service boundary. This is a critical metric that you need to develop. Um, the nodal development that we showed you along the I-4 corridor has a key precept to it that I want to underscore. Once you draw the boundary, please stick to it. You will be under enormous pressure over that 25 years to expand the boundary. Don't do it. You need to find a mechanism to preserve the land that makes Tampa what it is. And I mean Tampa Bay. Um, I'm sorry to use the shorthand, but I mean Tampa Bay, the county. You have a precious resource here that you don't want to squander because if you lose it, it's gone. And we don't want you to be in 2040 looking back and saying, oh my gosh, we look just like every sprawled city in the United States. You're not yet, but you're on your way. And so you really need to plan for what you want to look like in your future and you want to move towards it. I want to underscore one other thing that uh, I may not have been clear in our recommendations. You have a comprehensive plan that is about six inches thick. And that comp plan is full of regulatory language that does not belong there. It belongs in your regulations. So we really encourage you, as part of what Kazi recommended to you, that you redo your comp plan so that it is your guiding principles. That's what comp plans are. And that you move all of the regulatory language that's appropriate, and not all of it in there is because it's, some of it's contradictory. I guarantee you we did not read all six inches. <laughs> um, that, that you move that into your, into your regulations as opposed to putting them in the comp plan itself. We were told that very thing four years ago at yes. the other group, and we haven't done it. Well, that brings <laughs> me to my last point. We are certainly aware, uh, as you will I, that this is not the first time that we performed a panel for you, not this group, but an uh, Urban Land Institute. And we looked at that report, of course, um, as we before and as we were um, deliberating. Um, and we noted in that report that you've made really good progress, but there's still a lot to be done. We recommend strongly that you pull the, that report out and blow it off <laughs> and take the recommendations there in concert with the recommendations that we've made to you here about this specific area and do them in tandem. You still have work to do on both of them at yes. this point. Okay, last slide. I'm sure you're happy to hear. The county really needs to see this as an inflection point. And my computer just crashed. Of course, <laughs> just as chaos. I was about to actually read notes here to make sure that I was saying what I needed to say, of course my computer just crashed. Nope, here we go. You know, opportunity can be scary because opportunity involves, often involves change. In fact, most often involves change. And change is truly scary because you don't really know what's going to happen to you when you're going through change. This quote from Deepak Chopra um, is a great one because uh, all change is preceded by chaos. And that's true in your personal lives as well as in um, your uh, administrative lives. Um, as you heard here, there is no no action proposal here. You know, w when we're doing analysis, we will always look at no action, but you don't want to have happen what happens if you do nothing. Um, you will not like what you see when you turn around 25 years from now and look at the results of that process. Um, you know, doing nothing is a choice just as much as doing something is. And um, we, we would like you to make good choices here. The land use choice for Hillsborough County is between the current model, which won't get you where you want to go because you can't accommodate that much growth within the county, which means it's going to go somewhere else, which is going to make your existing transportation problems even worse, even worse, because they're going to be further out. Everything's going to be further out. Um, so my last word to you, this isn't a choice, really. Change is going to happen. It's how you manage that change that is important. And I'm going to just uh, finish by saying it's great to be different. And Tampa's different, right? You are um, made different both by your level of what, what you do, your level of industriousness, 
the intelligence of the people here that we saw on full display during our interviews and during the week we've been with you here. But it's also part of what you have been given. And what you've been given is a unique environment, both in terms of climate and in terms of the nature of your surroundings, which are absolutely beautiful. And we encourage you to preserve those things that make you special um, and not to squander them. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and allowing us to come and uh, be with you for the last week. And we're ready for questions. Well, thank you again so much. We do have questions from commissioners. And I will say we have reached or gone past our allowed time frame for the meeting, but every minute is well spent with you all. Um, so we will just kind of limit our questions to the panel because I know they all have flights and getting out of here. Uh, but Commissioner Miller is going to be recognized first. Thank you. And then thank you. I, I have to get out of here also because I have something else. And I want to thank you all for, for being here and doing the work that you've done this past week. I'm sorry when I had to have the, uh, my interview, I was home not feeling that well, and we did it on the phone. Uh, but thank you very much. I don't know if the, the presentation you're going to give us. I don't know if it's the slides or it's a thick book that you're going to give us. But there are two things that I want to ask you about that you touched on briefly, uh, very briefly. And at the end, this may become chaotic before the change. You did not really get in depth about transportation and transit. You talked about uh, density within the urban service area and not expanding the urban service area for the next five years, but also thinking about changing it as we expand the density in the urban service area. But you didn't talk about, as we expand that density, what do we do transportation-wise and transit-wise? That's number one. Number two, when you talk about chaotic issues, one of the things we may have to face next year is if the $25,000 additional tax exemption comes on board, it's going to be chaotic, chaotic for us. Chaos. What do we do at that point? Maybe that's something that you want to touch on. Maybe you want to back away from it. Maybe you want to run away from it. <laughs> But we as elected officials here, if that passes, we are really, well, not our elected officials, our staff also, we are really uh, up a creek without a paddle. Well, Commissioner Miller, um, those are very good questions. And that transition period is hard work in terms of transportation as you move from uh, now a very low density, highly auto dependent um, situation to a somewhat denser um, development where you start to develop more transportation options. So various things can be done. There will be a lot of pressure on capacity of your, your existing street system. What I would encourage is looking at all of the opportunities to create a few more connections. Within the first five to eight years and this 25-year uh, spectrum, I think the panel encourages increasing connectivity it's connectivity that is the most important objective capacity is part of that but the more connections you create the better things work increasing density will start to bring some transportation effic efficiencies mixed use development is far more efficient than spread out single uses it simply <coughs> captures more you have more opportunities to um, find a place to eat, to shop, to work, to play within closer proximity to where you live or work. Um, so that, that density is also, density with mixed use means proximity. And that's where the efficiencies come from. And then those efficiencies can be expanded on when more connections are made. The plans, uh, the county plans have the concept of the spine but a spine only works when there are actually some ribs and appendages that <coughs> attach to it. Those have to be created. You have opportunities within the urban services area to create those ribs and extremities. That's where the emphasis has to go. There are some operational improvements to the arterial streets. There are very sophisticated <coughs> signal timing systems now that react in real time to address traffic flow. You can get 10 to 15 percent increases in capacity just by better managing signals. Uh, there'll be more opportunities to increase transit service and frequency and those connections is the most important part of that. Within this time frame, we'll have to figure out how to accommodate automated vehicles. We don't know exactly how they're going to behave. They will start to have an effect. 
when there are a lot of them, they'll make better use of our system. Um, so those are things we need to think about. But uh, again, mix of use, connectivity. Um, you can start now, and then those are the fund those are the building blocks for the um, when when you do expand the boundary into the nodes. So, and I'll be done. So we as an elected body have to make the commitment to have the ribs and everything else attached to the backbone and not do politics and play politics, but do the politically right thing. <laughs> you have to answer that. <laughs> yeah. No one has to so I want to, to add on to, the, to what Ross was saying and to, to your question about transit. One thing that we didn't really say was that you know, density within the urban service area is not necessarily uniform and there's not a one solution across the entirety of the urban service area. Uh, and, and the comprehensive plan gives some guidance, but probably some more uh, recommendations and planning needs to go around sort of which corridors make the most amount of sense to really start applying this density. Right. So you're doing this in a strategic way, and sort of these dense nodes start to appear along these corridors that both can accommodate transit and make a lot of sense for connecting people that you know, sort of have that most connective uh, potential that Ross was talking about. So I think there's probably a lot more planning and thing to do about where you want to start placing this investment internal to the urban service area and start coming up with a sort of these guidelines that, that sort of promote that kind of growth. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner, I just wanted to echo that this board has already undertaken two initiatives that really start going in that direction, the Brandon Quarters and Node study that has come to you and will be coming back to you in the beginning of next year really does represent that. We think the Route 60 corridor along where the hospital is and, and the Main Street is an opportunity for that. But I think the other one that begins to, to speak to this notion of mobility is the South County Mobility Study that you have endorsed and that we're starting with as well. Huge. Commissioner Kemp. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to say that I think this is watershed for us. Very powerful, very strategic. Um, it is, I so deeply appreciate that this was done. I didn't know that you all were volunteers, but I don't think we could pay you enough <laughs> for what you've offered us here this morning. It's really priceless. Um, it's really, really wonderful and so desperately needed. I'd like to thank Lucia Garces, because I know you were the, uh, behind this all and put it together and um, thank you for bringing this forward and, and Mike Merrill for recognizing the value. I think we have desperately needed this um, and it comes on the heels of the Tampa Bay Partnership um, broad study uh, regional of um, our relationship to the 20 competitive areas of which I recently saw a, they did, uh, it's an incredible thing. I'm tr still trying to absorb it, but Tampa Bay just sat at the bottom, sat at the bottom, sat at the bottom while all the other 20 competitive areas were started moving to the top in all different kinds of metrics. And we were behind 20th out of 20 in transit. We were actually third in commuting. Um, and most people here don't think about that, but we, we had the third most uh, uh, decent commute. We were 20th in all kinds of education standards. We're 25th out of 25 top metro areas in median wages. We desperately have to start to remake and value ourselves and not just the growth comes to us. We're lucky in that way, but we have to start being a little bit discriminating and a little bit, um, or not a little bit. <laughs> we have to really start to look at how we lay this all down and how we plan the future. And as a new commissioner, I have to say that I don't think that that um, uh, plan has been out there. Um, I as a activist in the past, um, I didn't know there was a, but I wanted to start a hold the line campaign. <laughs> and then I hear it um, today. I've been beside myself at future uh, land use meetings that we've had here at the piecemeal and I feel unconsidered nature of how we've broken the urban service line without thinking about how we want to do that. So I deeply appreciate, uh, you know, the, uh, Tampa Bay Partnership kind of identified um, a few of our strengths, many of our weaknesses, um, but it didn't give us the kind of nuts and bolts that you all have given us in very, I feel, specific ways that we can build on to move forward to build the county that I think we all aspire to, but we haven't had 
a plan or a way to move forward. And I, I just very much appreciate putting um, this forward as a plan. Thank you very much. I feel um, all the things uh, that you had brought up, um, this is very bold. Um, it's new, but uh, you know, I am um, pretty much, I mean, I'll we'll look at the details, but I am um, really grateful because we've needed to do something like this. And as uh, Molly said, I think the uh, communities are changing, and, and I liked how you said that. There, we're falling in love again with communities, um, and people are looking for vibrant, walkable communities, um, sense of place, um, and we are also, again, looking for moving back to mixed use. Um, our community plans haven't worked in the way I don't think that people have aspired for them to work because um, no one had, you know, they wanted to have something like walkable town halls, but no one's investing and doing, or town centers, no one is doing that investment or uh, making that happen. Instead, we just keep breaking the urban service line or putting down things in a way that's brings us nothing but um, sprawl, not mixed use, not transit-oriented uh, places, um, doesn't bring us the opportunities we can have for growth that is valuable and, um, and is meaningful for people and uh, brings jobs and opportunities. So um, I just um, can't say enough. And um, thank you all very much. And I look forward to really working further on this. OK. We do I, need I'd like to questions because we're oh. going to start to lose members and panel members. Uh, but go ahead, please. I wanted to make a quick response to Commissioner Miller's before I see he has to leave. Um, what we're seeing from a fiscal standpoint these days is most communities are having to move away from property taxes as the major source of revenue and moving towards sales tax revenue and other sources of revenue like that. Wish we could do that. Unfortunately, Big Brother in Tallahassee controls that side of the money for us. Not all of it. Not all of it, but a lot, of, all it. of, it. A lot some, of it. Some of these things we could do ourselves. Yeah. Some of them, yes. And the other thing that I'd like to mention to you also is you need to explore sources of revenue to tax the tourists that are traveling through your area. They're 80 or they're as much as 20 to 25 percent of the, the people that are taxing your infrastructure and looking at unique ways to make them pay for the, the benefits that they're getting from your community is also going to be very important. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, some some of this we can do ourselves. The 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 the, uh, the uh, twenty-five thousand dollar additional uh, homestead exemption that was done by our legislature, and and that's got to go to the public, and we don't know what's going to happen there. But when it comes to looking at additional sales tax to meet our needs, specifically in transportation transit, that's something we as a local body of county commissioners can ask the public to do ourselves. The other thing is you just mentioned, the tourist tax and the bed tax, something we can look at. We're, we're booming in conventions coming into Tampa and Hillsborough County, and we need to look at how we can much more, add much more to that coming into us, and how could we utilize <coughs> that to meet the needs of the people, our public, our constituents that we have to, we have to service for every, each and every day. I hate to run, but I got, I've got to go. Nice. Right, and actually we do need Dan, but, and Commissioner Chris will have our final question. Thank you. I, I first want to want to compliment you. I, a, at the beginning, I was somewhat skeptical. I even asked questions of my interviewers. I wanted to know who your sponsors were and how you were funded, um, and and because I wanted to get an idea of what was driving this train. And when you started today, my radar was still up in the air because everyone here is a planner, an engineer, a developer, a real estate person, and there's no one here from Environmental Protection Agency. There's no one here representing the Sierra Club or the Audubon Society or any of the environmental groups. So I was beginning to get the idea that, you know, this was all going to be about development. And I've got to say, you really, really, really came through solidly, and I, I am very impressed with what you presented today. It was well-balanced. It took all aspects into fair and just consideration. And I think you provided us with a realistic recommendation that could satisfy all parties involved. And I'm seeing heads being nodded out there in the audience. Um, and, 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 I, and I just got to say thank you. Thank you. Um, 
couple of things. One is on the transportation. What I took away from this was the importance of two things. Density. Because when you look at the cities that were on your chart at the beginning that were the highly dense areas, those were the cities with the magnificent mass transit systems. Okay? So infill is going to be critical for us to jumpstart a mass transit system. The second thing I took away, took away, and you said it concisely when you said the spine and the ribs, is as we're looking at commuter rails out into our suburban areas, which have been the naysayers about doing any kind of um, transportation system, we're now building density nodes without developing the whole outskirts, which creates a small little infrastructure of transportation networks, but allows us to connect and gives us reason to connect and begins to pull out of the core, core area. So I, I took that away. Um, one of the things that you did for me was in the last seven years in dealing with Lucia and, and with Mike, I'm an advertising guy. And, 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 and I like to do templates, design templates. And the first community plan I worked on 30 years ago up in the university area, and it's been very successful. And um, it was done with a federal grant in the University of South Florida, and we made sure that all of our focus groups were balanced. And if we didn't have balance in stakeholders, we didn't have a quorum. So when we were done, we had 90% agreeability, which most of them don't. Mike, now you understand why placement and design is so critical, because when you build that critical mass, it becomes the face of your community. And that's why I've been all over you about everything from street lights to bus stops and why it all needs to play into the theme in that area. And each community is going to have a different theme. And, and I love the fact that they reinforce that because it helps me with you. <laughs> um, but I, again, I, I just got to say, you really um, came through, and, and I'm impressed, and I am very grateful. And, and I love the three hours that we spent. You're a very smart lady. And it was like two, two machine guns, and, and you are too, sir, all three machine guns firing at each other for three hours. But we covered a lot of ground. Thank you, Commissioner Chris. And um, I'll, my final comments are, you know, you have set the stage. This is a, a really a, a long-term thing that we have to commit ourselves to. But we have the uh, gold mine of opportunity here to decide what we want our county to look like. And I think that's what you've set the stage for, land use, economic development, housing, all those elements fitting in together, and, but to not lose our character. I think that is what is so critical. I've always said I grew up in Indianapolis, love suburbs. We've never done that here. We've allowed Sproul without having those centers of influence. And I think that's where the moment we're at is really getting there. So, Mike, do you want to wrap up and tell us where our next steps are? And then we will conclude. Sure. So this is not the end of the conversation. It's just the beginning. A very long conversation with a lot of milestones along the way. We will um, come back within about 90 days, uh, schedule a workshop with the board as well as some community uh, meetings to take this to the next level. So we want to give enough time uh, for the panel to produce its report because you will get a, a formal report and slides. It's just they have to produce it. Give everyone time to review it and then uh, come back in a workshop format. We can then begin to kind of flesh out what the next steps are, begin to identify milestones. The board can give us direction on how you want to do that. Engagement with the community. Um, so over the next year, we can kind of have a plan of, of how we work through this. So that would be, in the short run, I think, how I would propose to kind of. It's a good plan. So. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to use every word of what you <laughs> gave us today. It's uh, like the comments have been great from the commissioners, too. So you can tell we're engaged. Um, totally and we want the community to be engaged with us so thank you all thank you audience for coming thank you all very very much this is a process we're going to include you and we look forward to the outcome we're adjourning happy holidays thank you have yet to be
surrounding land use pattern. The applicant has also submitted a waiver. Today we're celebrating some wonderful additions. 